Hi there. Now we're going to discuss the pharmacokinetics of procainamide. So I'm going to use the same idea. We'll start out talking about what is procainamide, what is it used for, um, and then we will um, talk about the different, we'll start with clearance and go through just like we did before. Okay. So procainamide is another antiarrhythmic, as you probably realize. Um, it's not used that much anymore, but it is a um, class uh, 1C antiarrhythmic, I believe. And it is a sodium channel blocker. And it's indicated for both supraventricular and ventricular arrhythmias. Um, and so I guess that tells you all of that. We now have other drugs that have less side effects. And, you know, remember, I'm going over these drugs because these all have fairly small therapeutic ranges. So they're a little more finicky and you can get into trouble more easily with these drugs than you can with drugs that have a larger therapeutic range. Okay, so how is it cleared? Well, here's a basic idea of what the clearance is. Its point is about a half a liter per hour per kilogram in a normal adult. Um, use ideal body weight if they're obese to determine that clearance. Now the FE is 0.5. Hmm, 0.5. So that means half of it shows up in the urine as unchanged drugs. So half of it's renal. And guess what? Half of it's not renal. Um, the renal clearance, we can figure out if we do the calculations that it undergoes both filtration and primarily is secreted. So you can think about the secretion uh, drug interactions that could occur with procainamide. Um, but then it's also cleared um, half by the liver, isn't it? So the hepatic clearance is, it also accounts for half of the clearance of the drug. So it's half by the kidneys, half by the liver. The enzymes that are responsible for its clearance, primarily it's cleared by the N-acetyltransferase, which is an important uh, phase two enzyme. Um, and also by 2D6. Now, what's interesting about the n transferase is that this is one of the first drugs that we saw that there could be um, people that are that metabolize the drug more quickly than others, and there's other people that metabolize the drug more slowly than others. So we, even when I was in school, we knew that there were slow and fast acetylators. So this was one of the first pharmacogenomic differences that we saw in patients. So if you have, if you genetically are pre-programmed to have less N-acetyltransferase, guess what? You're not going to uh, clear the drug as quickly, are you? If you have more than you would expect to, than a normal person. I shouldn't say normal, but if you have more um, N-acetyltransferase around than others, then you are going to clear the drug more quickly. And one of the ways you can look at that is the formation of the metabolite. The metabolite that's formed by acetylation is, cause, is called um, NAPA, N-acetyltransferase. N acetyl uh, procainamide. It's not the um, wine growing country in California, but you can remember it that way. Think of your wine. Anyway, if the NAPA, as you can see here in, in parentheses here, if the NAPA, which is the metabolite that's formed by the N acetyl transferase over the parent drug, just the procainamide, is greater than 1.2. So you're making more NAPA than what would be expected. What does that mean? That means that you may be a rapid acetylator. So if your NAPA to procainamide ratio is greater than 1.2 or equal to, then you may be a rapid acetylator. How common is this? Well, interestingly enough, Caucasians and African Americans, it's about 50-50. There's about 50 rapid acetyl acetylators and 50% 50, 50 rapid acetylators and 50% normal or slow acetylators. Some people call them slow acetylators. So um, as you can imagine, this is, so it's a toss up for most of the American population as to whether or not you're a fast or slow. You can't even say what's normal because there's not normal. It's half or ha half and half. 80 to 90% of Asian descent, especially Japanese and Eskimo, where we have most of the data, are rapid acetylators. So if you 
um, are dealing with in a clinic that has a lot of Asian uh, patients, which was certainly the case when I lived on the West Coast, you're going to be making a lot more Napa than you would in uh, people that are slow acetylators. Only about 20% of people from Middle Eastern descent would be in the rapid acetylator status. So you can see that this is really dependent somewhat on your um, genetic makeup. Now let's talk a little bit more about the active metabolite NAPA. It is cleared, as you can see, by the kidney, right? 85% of it arrives in the uh, urine as NAPA. So it doesn't go on to be metabolized. It goes on to go out in the urine. So, uh, and the half-life is about double that. I don't even know if we got to the half-life yet, but half-life of procainamide is about three hours, and the half-life of NAPA is about six hours. So what can happen is if you have a rapid acetylator is that you can be making more and more NAPA, and it will accumulate because the half-life is longer. If you have somebody that's got renal impairment, then you've got a big problem. Because remember, half of... Uh, Procainamide is cleared half by the kidneys and half by the liver. And if you um, take away the kidneys by having renal impairment, then most of the drug is going to be cleared by the liver. And especially if you're a rapid acetylator, you're going to be making a lot more NAPA. And then the NAPA has to get cleared by the kidneys. So you're going to end up with very high NAPA levels because you're making more NAPA, but you're not able to clear it and you can end up with toxicities due to the NAPA because it is active. It's got about the same activity as the parent drug as far as the antiarrhythmic effect. So it's an interesting drug. Okay, back to procainamide now. The volume of distribution is about 2.7 liters per kilogram. Not as big as digoxin, but certainly not small either. It's on the large side again. Um, we use uh, ideal body weight for patients who weigh over uh, greater than 30% over their ideal body weight. And again, the volume decreases in renal failure. It also decreases in heart failure. That's probably because of binding changes, but as you can see, it's not highly bound in the plasma. It's more highly bound in the tissue, which is what we would expect from this volume and distribution. And so the changes are probably in that tissue binding and renal failure and heart failure, which makes sense. All right. Half-life, I skipped this, a half-life of procainamide is about three hours. Remember that the half-life of NAPA is about six hours. So it's a lot longer. So this is the mean, 3.3 hours. Therefore, we usually give it as a sustained release product because you don't want to have to take something every three hours, for goodness sake. The bioavailability of procainamide is about 83%. Again, we wouldn't expect it to be, it's not a high extraction drug, I forgot to mention that. The hepatic clearance is low extraction. We would not expect there to be a high first pass effect. So um, the bioavailability is about 83%. The therapeutic range we're shooting for, for procainamide is between four and 10 milligrams per liter. And for NAPA, the therapeutic range is between 10 and 30. There's all kinds of fancy ways they try to add these up and divide by two and blah, blah, blah. Um, usually you're just shooting for this range with a rocanamide. If the NAPA gets too high, though, you can have uh, dose-related side effects that will force you to DC the drug, stop the drug. And so let's talk about those concentration-dependent adverse effects. Again, you're going to have the GI disturbances, which we have with pretty much all drugs. You're going to also see CNS stuff like weakness and malaise. Cardiovascular, you're going to see a decrease in blood pressure. Um, and what it does is prolongs the um, PR interval. And I should have put PR interval here. Um, and can put you at risk for torsades, especially at higher concentrations. So I'm sure you've talked about torsades. If not, I'll explain it in class a little bit more. But this is a big star by this. By this, We want to know that, again, with these antiarrhythmics, when you start messing with the electrical system of the heart, which is what we're doing with these drugs, you're putting the, the patient then at very high risk for causing, causing arrhythmias, which is not really surprising when you think about it, although worrisome. Wait, that's not done yet. What happened? Hmm. 
Am I missing a slide? Well, I'll just tell you quickly. One of the other things you really want to be concerned about, I'll try to find the slide and make another video, but um, in case I can't find it, um, another big concern with procainamide, especially in slow acetylators, is um, that you can see um, lupus, drug-induced lupus. Um, and that procainamide is one of the kind of famous drugs for causing that. So um, that's it. Thanks for listening. I'll try to get the better slide thing up on Blackboard. Sorry, I was working on different versions all day, and obviously I've screwed up again. All right. Thank you. Bye.